What a great Lord's Day. I think maybe I sang too loud or something, but my voice feels scratchy all of a sudden. (coughs) Which I don't mind losing my voice for that reason. (coughs) Well, since things are a little more on track after the snowstorms we had, at least, well, maybe, I hear that there's still one looming in the horizon somewhere waiting to pounce on us later in the week. I don't know if that's actually going to happen, but you know how rumors go. But who knows? February is not over, is it? But because at least now we've been a little bit more on track, having met two times in a row now, just two Sundays in a row, let me share with you the direction that we are going to go for the next several weeks. Since we have been on the subject of discipleship for a few weeks, this is probably as good a time as any to accomplish something that has been on my heart for some time. I've mentioned it on several occasions in time past. Maybe some of you may remember once we get into this. But now I believe it's time for us to go down this path for the purpose of our spiritual growth here at Calvary Chapel of Manassas. We're going to set aside our verse-by-verse teaching uh, through the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to begin a survey on the essentials of the Christian faith. I've been wanting to do this for a while, It's been brewing in my heart. I've talked to some of you personally about it. And today is the day that we are going to embark on this journey. Now, it's probably no coincidence that at this present time, our children are being taught this very subject in the classrooms downstairs. And I believe that our church is in a season right now where this will be very beneficial for the flock. This is an excellent way to supplement and support what we do in going verse by verse through the scriptures. Every so often it's good to break up the routine of going verse by verse in order to spend some time working through a particular subject that we want to focus on. Now, at some level, we do this while we're going verse by verse because we'll, in the process of going verse by verse, we'll hit a theme and we'll focus on it for a little while. But now we're really going to hit a theme. We're going to hit a theme in a a, a big-time way. For the next several weeks, we are going to work through, in a systematic way, the essential teachings of the Christian faith, what some people call, what I call, (laughs) the non-negotiables. And I would like to use two sections of Scripture from which to launch from. Both sections of Scripture teach some very basic principles that really get to the heart of why I feel we need to take the time to go through this type of study. The first passages that we're going to look at happen to be the very ones that we read at the beginning of last week. But this time we will be emphasizing a different aspect. These verses provide scriptural support for the need of unity in the essentials of the Christian faith. So if you will please open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to say, before we begin reading, I know that there are a number of people in this flock that are very seasoned in their walk, some that are more so than others. This is the type of teaching that regardless of where you happen to be in your walk, this is the type of teaching that 
truly is timeless and truly will always meet every single person right where they're at. Because we can never grow weary of either reaffirming what we already know and have nailed down or perhaps learning some things and solidifying some doctrinal essentials that, you know, maybe we don't study that much. Maybe it's not something, sometimes we don't actually study something topically until we're confronted with it and we need to. You know, like when that, when that Jehovah Witness knocks at the door and starts hitting you with some, some questions about the Trinity. And then it's like, oh man, I need to do, I need to, I need to refresh my, <clears throat> my thinking about you know, the doctrine of the Trinity or you get that Mormon that knocks on the, on the door that tells you you're a God. Oh man, I gotta, <clears throat> I gotta do a little work and you know, learning up about this. And, and uh, so that's why I believe that messages like this are somewhat timeless and always applicable. Last week we read through <clears throat> some verses here in Ephesians chapter four and I made an announcement about the usage of particular gifts in a particular context. Well, now we're gonna look at another grouping of gifts and the purpose that they fulfill for the body of Christ. Let's just jump right in and start reading at verse 11. <clears throat> Passages of scripture that are probably very familiar to many of us. Ephesians 4, Verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists <clears throat> and some as teachers, excuse me, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Let's stop right there. <clears throat> In verse 13, the unity of the faith. In this context, as I mentioned last week, means an agreement on the essentials. It means doctrinal unity. This is the ministry goal of the offices that are listed <clears throat> in verse 11. And this is the greatest emphasis in their particular calling to cause the body of Christ to learn and conform to the essentials of the Christian faith. In verse 12, <clears throat> this is part of the equipping that these offices are endeavoring to achieve. These offices are to help the saints obtain the knowledge of the Son of God. And as a result of our corporate growth in these things, Verse 14 continues. <clears throat> As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects <clears throat> unto him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Doctrinal unity is something that we should be striving for. And this is how we fulfill the goal of verse three, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. 
And the goal that is listed in verse 14 is crucial for us to achieve if we are ever going to fulfill the ones that are listed in verses 15 and 16. If we are bouncing around in confusion over what the essential foundations of the Christian faith are, then how will we properly accomplish the goal of mutual edification? How can that possibly be accomplished if we ourselves are fuzzy or confused about what the essential foundations of the Christian faith are? In fact, I would argue that the need for studying these things and equipping ourselves in the days in which we live is even greater than those who were living in the past, those who were living at the time of the, of, of the Apostle Paul when he wrote this epistle. Deception, both outside and inside the church, is at an all-time high. In the church today, <clears throat> we are experiencing a fresh new wave of attacks from the enemy that is both subtle and yet it is highly poisonous. A large growing movement within Christianity is countering what biblically minded Christians have historically believed about what the Bible teaches since apostolic times. And these liberally minded folks are showing complete indifference to doctrinal purity. One particular <clears throat> source that I read said that many young evangelicals dislike both traditional Christianity and the seeker-sensitive churches. Traditional Christianity is described as too focused, now I want you to track with this, too focused on being right, too much into Bible studies and, and apologetic materials. Instead, the young evangelicals are lusting after a renewed encounter with a God that goes beyond doctrinal definitions, experiencing God beyond the boundaries of Scripture. Now that's subtle and maybe even spiritual sounding. I want to experience God as He really is. But I consider ideas or mindsets like that to be very deceptive. How far outside the boundaries of Scripture are we talking about? Many years ago, <clears throat> the founder of the Vineyard Movement, John Wimber, who is now with the Lord, he made a statement one time. You guys know in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, let everything, let all things be done decently and in order. He felt the Spirit was telling him for the Vineyard Movement, let all things be done. Really? Like what? <laughs> Where does that end? Well, I can tell you where it led the vineyard movement about 15 years ago. <laughs> Let all things be done. Let's bark. Let's howl. Let's crow like roosters in our services. Let all things be done. I want to experience God beyond the boundaries of Scripture. <clears throat> in light of subtle statements like that, I believe the need is very great for us to be keenly aware of the essentials of the Christian faith. Now, is the goal of achieving unity in the faith unrealistic? Is this really possible? Or are we just swinging our fists blindly into the air? Well, the answer is no. We're not just swinging our fists blindly into the air. And the answer is a resounding yes, that unity in the essentials is obtainable. In fact, it is to be expected. It is to be the natural byproduct of people 
who are endeavoring to follow the Lord. Turn with me to the second set of passages that we're going to cover today in relation to this topic, the book of Jude. Go to the right from Ephesians to the book of Revelation and go left, one book. (laughs) Jude's small. If you blink your eyes, you'll pass it. (coughs) Excuse me. Since Jude is just one chapter. Right before the book of Revelation. There is a need (coughs) to defend the essentials. There is indeed a core body of beliefs for us to agree upon and defend. And we need to understand that. There is a core body of beliefs for us to agree upon and which we need to defend. Jude, writing this letter, this very brief epistle, he says in verse 1, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, While I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, stealthily, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of our Lord into, five dollar word here, licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's stop right there. Now you can read through the book of Jude on your own and you can see the power with which Jude addresses the church body, the church of Christ that he's writing to, you can see how powerfully he addresses the issue of these false apostles, shepherds, prophets, what have you, coming in and and integrating amongst the people of God, joining them in their love feasts, and bringing doctrines that were contrary to the faith that he says was once that was once and for all handed down to the saints of God. Now he says in verse three, it would have been nice, even preferable, to write to you about the common salvation. Common salvation meaning the body of truth that the churches commonly agreed upon. Now this indicates that already at this time, what the churches by and large needed to agree on, they did. There were essentials or non-negotiables that were commonly recognized. Contrary to many who like to take pot shots at the church universal, the church, the church of Jesus Christ is not living in a state of flux over what it holds as essential. It is not. Don't be thrown for a loop over some of the denominational distinctives that we have in Christendom as though that means there is no consensus about what the truth is. The true church is in agreement over the essentials. Though we may not though we may have in-house debates over some non-essentials, the New Testament is very clear about what the essentials are. Now, I know that there are some churches that are abandoning those, and I understand that. But the New Testament is clear on what the essentials are. There's no fog. There's no fuzz. They're there. They exist. They can be studied. 
they can be examined, they can be scrutinized, but they are there. Now we are going to be going the opposite direction that Jude was taking his readers. But I wanted to use this as a point of reference to show us simply that the foundation of our beliefs has already been laid. It is knowable and defending it is essential. It's necessary. We must defend it. So please keep that in mind. Now for our purposes, I decided to simplify things as much as possible to make things more accessible. <clears throat> For some reason, it seems like it's much easier to wrap our minds around a teaching called the essentials of Christianity rather than systematic theology. <laughs> but systematic theology is exactly what we will be covering. Systematic theology is a process of collecting and organizing various components and or doctrines of the Bible according to their theme. It's the arranging of biblical data into topical form. And this makes it very effective for learning what the Bible teaches about a particular subject, like the Trinity or the resurrection or salvation. The word <coughs> systematic simply means the assemblage of things into a whole. While the word theology is actually a compound word coming from the Greek word for God, theos, and the word ology, which comes from the Greek word logos, another uh, word that essentially means word or discourse. So as a whole, Theology is simply the science or the study of God. As in a nutshell, that's what it means. Now let me say up front that as much as we are going to try and simplify this, there still may be some challenging terminology. But we need to step up to the challenge. You've probably heard it said before that the gospel is simple enough for a child to understand. And that certainly is true. God can reveal himself to a small child. A small child can get saved and can understand and, and know about Jesus. <clears throat> but eventually, that small child will need to grow up and mature. And as he grows, <clears throat> the limited understanding that he had as a child will have to expand if he hopes to mature. Sometimes in our quest to simplify biblical information in order to present it, we can actually retard people's growth by encouraging the natural propensity that we all have to be lazy. I mean, let's face it. Sometimes when we're pushed outside of our comfort zones, we don't like that. Spiritual depth comes from spiritual meat. And growing spiritually means that we need to be willing to dig and toil and sweat and to allow ourselves to be stretched and to be pulled out of our comfort zones. Sometimes when we listen to sermons and biblical teachings, we will be confronted with terminology that is unfamiliar to us. Sometimes this will cause us to shrink back and retreat to something that is more simplified. As hard as Bible teachers endeavor to give their students, to give their sheep lessons that they can fully understand, biblical language can only be simplified so much. We need to allow ourselves to be pushed beyond our own intellectual limitations. I remember years ago, <clears throat> uh, a few people and I having conversations about Bible commentaries. We always want to find that Bible commentary that's going to explain things to us in just the way we want to hear it. <clears throat> we buy a Bible commentary and there's all these words in there I don't understand. What do we do? Buy another one? Well, maybe. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
But how about get a dictionary and look up the words and see what they mean? How about that? How about digging into something that may be in the beginning over our heads and rising up to that level rather than always trying to simplify things so much that we never get beyond the childness of just paddling around in the baby pool. At some point, you just gotta jump in and swim, you know? <clears throat> and you know what? Eventually, you'll start swimming, believe it or not. In the course of this study, we are going to interact with some theological language that may stretch us. I will do everything that I can to define and simplify terms. But we're going to have to rise up at some level to these terms and just say, okay, I just need to find out what that means. And let's try not to be intimidated by that, okay? Don't let that cause you to shrink back and think this is something I don't want to be into because there's just no other way to simplify it anymore sometimes, okay? Now, why... Systematic theology. Well, <clears throat> what I want to do to kind of move this into the direction we're going to be heading is I want to look at three logical reasons why we need systematic theology and how it helps to deliver to us the essentials of Christianity. We may think this is something that is only for pastors. Well, at some level, there are, there, there are certainly... <clears throat> are some, some branches of this study that, that ministers will need to know more than other people will need to know. That, that's true. But there are many components of the essentials of Christianity that every Christian has to know. So why systematic theology? Well, number one, systematic theology serves as an explanation of Christianity. Systematic theology is necessary as a researched and studied explanation as well as a systematic organization of the doctrines that are foundational and necessary to Christianity. As a result of systematic theology, Christians are able to have a clear understanding about the fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. The Bible, as you well know, was not written in a doctrinal outline. There's not one chapter on the Trinity or one chapter on that talks about just the resurrection. Oh, well, there's one big one that talks about it a lot. So it is important to systematize the parts of the Bible to understand the doctrinal emphasis of the entire Bible. That's why, historically, the church has come up with what we call creeds or statements of faith. Those statements of faith or creeds are not meant to confuse people and to cause us to be so jumbled up with Christian red tape that we don't know what to believe anymore. The purpose of those creeds historically has been to define terms, to help bring into visibility what the Bible teaches about a particular subject. Another very important reason why we need systematic theology <clears throat> is it serves as an apologetic for Christianity. Systematic theology enables Christians to defend their beliefs rationally against opponents and antagonists to the faith. Early in the Christian church, believers used their systematized beliefs to address opponents and unbelievers. This is perhaps even more important today with the emergence of, of humanism, communism, cults, and Eastern religions, and I would even add to this, and by the way, this is direct quotations from uh, the Moody Bible Handbook of Theology, I would even add to this some of the things like the emerging church and even the seeker-sensitive church. The systemized doctrines of the Christian faith must be researched, delineated, delineated, in other words, presented in such a way uh, 
divvied up and categorized and then presented as a defense of historic Christianity. This is one of the ways that we do you know, the work that we're called to do when we have to give an account to everyone for the hope that lies within us. Sometimes, it, sometimes we have to be able to give an account that goes beyond just our own personal testimony of how we got saved. We may begin there, <clears throat> but somebody may have you know, rational questions about the existence of God and stuff like that. It takes us outside of just how we got saved. And thirdly, and lastly, to prepare us for what we're going to go through, systematic theology serves as a means of maturity for Christians. Systematic theology is an assertion of Christian truth. These same truths are essential to the maturity of believers. Paul's writings make it clear that doctrine or theology is foundational to Christian maturity in as much as Paul normally builds a doctrinal foundation in his epistles in his epistles before he exhorts believers to live correctly. You'll find that beautifully laid out in the book of Ephesians <clears throat> where you've got six chapters, three chapters dealing with what God has done for us and then three chapters dealing with, okay, now here's what you need to do for God. It's laid out wonderfully. Also, many Christians have faithfully attended church services for decades and yet have little understanding of the major doctrines of the Christian faith. Yet a knowledge of correct doctrine is important in Christian maturity. Moreover, it protects the believer from error. So many times, I've had people come up to me and they've handed me a book. What do you think of this book? And I'll look at it and I'll go, oh man, <laughs> why that book? Why did you have to pick that book? And then you have to tell them, you know, I wouldn't read that book. <clears throat> and you can tell sometimes it breaks people's hearts because all, maybe all they did was pick it up at the Christian bookstore because they read the back cover, <laughs> you know. But the author of the book may have a whole history of, of writing about things that you know as a pastor or even as a friend, you know that you don't want them really getting into that person's writings, even though that particular book may even be fine. <clears throat> but you know, man, don't get into this guy's stuff. It's going to lead you down a rabbit trail that you don't need to go down. <clears throat> Systematic theology helps protect us from that type of thing. It helps us to understand when we are listening to a teacher like me, <laughs> when we are reading something written by someone, listening to the radio, you know, whatever, we don't, as Christians, need to live in a state of, of apologetic paranoia, okay? But the scripture does tell us, and Jesus warned us to watch. Jesus told us to beware. We're not going to be approaching this subject so much from the standpoint of uh, spending a lot of time on warnings against this thing and that thing. We're going to be focusing more, and I, I hate, almost hate to use this phrase, but I'm going to use it anyway. We're going to be focusing things uh, more from the positive aspect, looking at what the Christian, what the Bible affirms as the truth, okay? But as we prepare to take communion today, I'm going to show you, I want to show you what my ultimate goal is in this study. And by the way, today is an introduction, in case you haven't figured that out yet. <clears throat> today is an introduction. And I thought this would be a good thing for us to talk about uh, prior to taking communion. But let me show you what my goal is. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. And this is the goal. <coughs> Musicians, if you guys want to come on up and get yourself settled, <coughs> that would probably be wise. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1. Now, remember what I said a couple weeks ago 
about what we should be praying as a body from Colossians 1. Okay. Ephesians 1 sort of says the same thing, but it just words it in a little bit different, in a little different way. Verse 16. Here is my goal. Excuse me, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe <clears throat> these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. It's that simple. That's my prayer. That's what I know we are going to accomplish by going through the essentials of the Christian faith. You guys can go ahead and start handing out communion now. Next, turn to the right to Ephesians 3. He says something very similar. <clears throat> Beginning to read at verse 14. He says, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. What I want to do <clears throat> is I want to study these things. I want us to look at these things as a flock, not to in puff us up with a lot of knowledge. It's it's sometimes, I believe, inappropriate. I, I understand when Paul the Apostle was writing to the Corinthians and said that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. There's a context for that. Sometimes we equate knowledge <clears throat> with a lack of spirituality. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is you have to have a knowledge base in order for you to be spiritually equipped. There has to be the knowledge before we can apply the knowledge and turn it into wisdom and live lives that are glorifying to the Lord. So my prayer in the course of this study is to not just make us fat with knowledge, but to equip our hearts with the knowledge of who God is. One of the amazing things about the story of the book of Exodus I believe it's in Exodus chapter 6. God was explaining to Moses the new way in which he was going to be revealing himself to the children of Israel as Yahweh, as Jehovah. The Lord had told Moses, I didn't reveal myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the way that I'm going to reveal myself to you. I'm giving you a new revelation of who I am. And the purpose of that was to, A, bring greater glory to God, <clears throat> but B, it was to deepen the knowledge that people had of God. Remember, the Bible is God's self-revelation. The Bible is God revealing himself to us. Some people can study the Bible as a textbook and it not do anything for them, and I understand that. But as Christians, the Bible, we know, is a source of spiritual food. And so to study <clears throat> the doctrinal themes that are contained in the Bible, the effect should be to enhance our growth as Christians. And all of us need to have a good foundation. Every single Christian, at some level, to some degree, should be able to offer up an explanation of 
why we believe in the Trinity, what, what the Bible says about salvation, what the Bible says about <clears throat> Christ, the Holy Spirit, sin, mankind. I mean, there's just, there's a lot, we'll get into that next week, but <clears throat> there are a lot of subject headings, a lot of information under each, each one of those headings. But as believers, as we are endeavoring to show ourselves approved unto God, we should be striving for Christian perfection, really. Jesus said, be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And of course, we can all say, well, I'm not perfect. Of course we're not. <clears throat> That's, that, that goes without saying. But does that mean that we just not try? Does that mean that we just uh, sit back and put it in neutral and coast down the hill? No, I think we should keep it in drive and race down the hill. <laughs> and then can't coast up the hill, obviously. Fortunately, the Lord allows many hills in our lives to keep us from coasting too long. <clears throat> but the Lord wants to deepen us in our knowledge base. He wants to bring maturity to this flock and how we understand God. I believe that Bible translators do a misservice to the church when in order to create a Bible that is what they may believe they're, they're doing is making it more simplified. Bible translators that try to simplify the Bible too much and do not differentiate between the different names of God. They do not help us in understanding God by changing, you know, when our, your King James Bible has an all-capped Lord, a small Lord, God, and the reason that's, that is the way it is is because there's a different Hebrew word for the word God there. <clears throat> we don't help anybody by just translating all of them as God. The Lord reveals himself as Lord in different ways. There's different manifestations that, of God and he wants us to understand what, what all that stuff's about as, as a Christian. So I hope that you're going to be encouraged as we go through this. And all the notes will be available. I'll make sure that all the notes after each week are available on the website. So you can download them. So a lot of the stuff, I'm going to be, I'm going to be showing tons of stuff up on the screen <clears throat> to help you guys so you can read along as I talk. So hopefully you get it you know, from, from sight and from hearing. Uh, but all the material will be available. You can download it uh, in a PDF form from the website. And I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to, uh, if there, I'm going I'm to probably move rather quickly. <clears throat> I don't want to uh, be in this study for five years. I don't plan on that. But the Lord wants to be glorified in our lives Jesus said when he was praying in John 17, he said, this is eternal life, that they may know thee, he was praying to his father, he said that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Knowing God. And knowing what the Bible says about him is one of the ways that we know God. He wants us to know him in a deeper way. And he wants us to understand why we do things like this. I know we've heard teachings on what communion means. Don't you always want to deepen your understanding with God? Don't you want to go deeper in your walk? I'm hoping the Lord's going to use us to help all of us <clears throat> to go deeper than we currently are. Let's celebrate the Lord's death right now. I know it sounds strange to be celebrating a death. <clears throat> it's sobering. But it is something worthy of celebration. Because his death <clears throat> means life for us. Let's pray to him. Father, today we want to thank you. Kind of an odd way of going into communion. But Lord, we want to praise you today. That you are 
a knowable God. We can know you. You want us to have a relationship with you. You're our Father, our Heavenly Father. And we want to thank you right now that you have made so much information about you available to us so that we can understand you. In many ways, you're mysterious to us. But Lord, all that we need for life and godliness we have contained in the scriptures. And Lord, we want to go through a, a brief season right now of digging out some of those, those nuggets and just chewing on them as a congregation. And right now, Father, we just want to thank you for sending your son to die for us on the cross. This is the way that you chose to save. And we thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Though the cross is, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish. Lord, to those of us who have eternal life, it is the power of God. And we thank you today. Brothers and sisters, would you eat the bread with me and drink the cup? And as you do, give thanks to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can just remain seated. We're going to close out in a song. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. One will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. <clears throat>